Hi everyone, I'm Jessica. And I'm Joey. And we work in the History Program Office at NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C. The NASA History Program Office keeps track of everything NASA has done since it was founded in 1958. That's only 54 years ago. That's younger than my grandparents. And in that time, NASA has done a whole lot more than just send a man to the moon. They've built planes that fly faster than the speed of sound, explored our solar system, and taken pictures of objects billions of light years away with the Hubble Space Telescope. In fact, Voyager 1, a spacecraft launched by NASA in 1977, is still traveling through the universe and will soon become the first man-made object to leave our solar system, showing us what lies beyond the reaches of our sun. In the History Program Office, we keep track of these events and the documents, videos, photos, and audio files that go with them. The original documents and photos are stored at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., but we keep copies here in our archives. Hey, Joey. Why do we even need to keep track of NASA history? It's already happened. Well, Jessica, NASA's making history every day. It's important to look back and know what we've done so we can repeat our successes and learn from our mistakes. That's right. And it's important to remember that we wouldn't be where we are today without the hard work and passion of the astronauts, engineers, scientists, and administrators who came before us. For example, do you know what the first A in NASA stands for? Oh, I know, I know. Uh, aeronautics. That's right. Aeronautics is the study of how things fly, and we've been studying aeronautics since long before NASA, starting with the NACA. The NACA? What's that? the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. It was started in 1915. That's not too long after the Wright brothers had their first flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Yep. When the Wright brothers flew the first airplane in 1903, people became very interested in building better and faster flying machines. Orville Wright was actually one of the early members of the NACA. At the NACA, engineers focused on designing planes that were faster, safer, and cheaper to build. They tested their designs in wind tunnels, tunnels above ground that had air flowing through them to mimic wind. Why was it so hard to build faster planes? It has to do with this thing called drag. Drag is a force that pushes against planes in the air. The faster the plane is flying, the more drag there is. So what did the engineers do? Well, they came up with many different designs. One of the ways they solved this problem was cowling, putting a hood on the engine of the plane. Like the hood on the engine of a car? Right. They also fiddled with the shape of the wings and plane body. One of the engineers, Richard Whitcomb, figured out in 1951 that a plane with a narrowed shape had less drag and could fly faster. How fast were those planes able to fly? At supersonic speeds, meaning faster than the speed of sound. In the 1940s, supersonic was all the rage. Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in 1947. Whoa! Are there planes that fly that fast today? There was a plane called the Blackbird, which was the world's fastest jet-propelled aircraft. In 1990, it flew from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in 1 hour, 4 minutes, and 20 seconds. It flew 2,124 miles per hour. That's like sprinting across 10 football fields per second. The Blackbird is retired now, but you can still visit it at the National Air and Space Museum's Udvarhazy Center in Virginia. So, when did the United States start preparing to go to space? That's a good question. It all started at the end of World War II when the United States and the Soviet Union were at odds with each other. The United States announced that it was going to place a satellite in orbit in 1957. But the Soviet Union got there first, didn't it? Yep. The Soviet Union launched the first satellite, Sputnik, into space on October 4, 1957. The United States was really worried that we were falling behind. So in 1958, President Eisenhower started NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA got to work right away, taking over the NACA and using all its resources to catch up with the Soviet Union in the new space age. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin may have been the first person in space, but with every mission, NASA reached new levels in unmanned and manned space exploration. With Project Mercury, Alan B. Shepard became the first American in space, and John H. Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. Pretty soon, we were strolling through space, as Edward H. White did the first spacewalk during Project Gemini. With the Apollo program, humans finally stepped onto the moon. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. President Kennedy challenged NASA to get us there before 1970, and we did it, just in the nick of time. 
In 1969, Neil A. Armstrong and Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin walked along the lunar surface. During their moonwalk, astronaut Michael Collins orbited the moon in the command module. Then, six more Apollo missions followed and 12 astronauts in total have been to the moon. But the going wasn't easy. For example, Apollo 13 didn't land on the moon, but it did return its crew safely back to Earth, making it a successful failure. The first scientist in space, a geologist named Jack Schmidt, went to the moon on Apollo 17. Oh, hey! There is orange soil! Hey, Jessica, what about the Soviet Union, the ones who made the first satellite, Sputnik? What happened to them? Well, they were just as busy developing their space program as we were. In 1975, the Americans and the Soviets worked together on a project called the Apollo Soyuz Test Project. Both countries launched their own spacecraft that joined together in space. After the Apollo Soyuz, NASA worked on the Space Shuttle program. Did you know that the Space Shuttle orbiters were reusable? Since 1981, five Space Shuttles, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavour, completed over 100 flights, orbiting the Earth more than 20,000 times. The shuttle program lasted for 30 years, from 1981 to 2011. In those 30 years and 135 Space Shuttle flights, two shuttles were tragically lost. Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003. They remind us that spaceflight is always a risk, and those that risk their lives to help us understand space are true heroes. The Space Shuttle program was a landmark project for NASA in many ways. Without the Space Shuttle, we wouldn't have been able to build the International Space Station, where astronauts and scientists from all over the world spend months doing research and learning about how being in space affects humans and changes different aspects of science. For example, how do people and processes change when there's no gravity? We also use the Space Shuttle to launch, repair, and upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope to observe stars and galaxies clearer than ever before. Joey, guess what? What? Did you know the International Space Station was not the first time Americans have spent long periods of time in space? NASA started keeping humans in orbit with Skylab, a small workshop that orbited Earth. Astronauts stayed there for months at a time, too. And what about the Shuttle Mir program? Before the International Space Station, NASA sent astronauts to the Russian space station Mir to learn more about long-duration spaceflight and to prepare for the challenges of building a new, complex space station. The success of the ISS depended on the ability of many different countries to work together, and the Shuttle Mir program was good practice. But Joey, did you know that not all space exploration requires a person to actually go into space? Really? How does that work? NASA often uses unmanned spacecraft to better understand new places. That way, when humans arrive, they know what to expect and are prepared. Even before NASA sent astronauts to the moon, they sent spacecrafts to take pictures and practice landing on the lunar surface. And what have we done since then? In the past 50 years, our unmanned spacecrafts have explored our entire solar system, particularly Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, looking for signs of water and life. These spacecrafts have gone farther than any human being. For example, the robotic space probes Pioneer 10 and 11 reached Jupiter and Saturn in the early 70s. Voyager 1 and 2 were also launched in the 70s to complete a grand tour of the solar system. They are still working today, and NASA believes that Voyager 1 is close to leaving our solar system. These probes are each carrying pictures and sounds from life on Earth, just in case they are found by extraterrestrials. NASA is also big on exploring Mars. It takes spacecraft 7 to 10 months to reach Mars, and landing on Mars is no easy task. The Pathfinder lander and Sojourner rover arrived on Mars in 1997 and provided an unprecedented amount of data about the planet. Two more rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, collected data about the geology and atmosphere of Mars starting in 2004. So what did they find out about Mars so far? Do little green Martians live on Mars? Scientists are very curious to find out how Mars has changed over time, particularly if water and life ever existed on Mars. And if they do find life, it probably won't be little green men. Instead, it might be tiny microbial life, about the same size as the thickness of one of your hairs. Hey, Joey. Yeah? I was thinking, what happened to aeronautics? Well, it's the first A in NASA, and it's still a very important part of NASA. NASA builds airplanes that fly at very fast speeds, such as the X-15, which was powered by a rocket, to help us practice building better planes for both travelers and the military. NASA also worked on lifting bodies, flying objects without wings. All of this work helped build the Space Shuttle. In 2004, the X-43 airplane built by NASA set a record by flying 10 times the speed of sound. Whoa, how fast is that? That's more than 11,000 feet per second. 
Did you know that NASA is also finding new ways to learn about Earth from the sky? How? Through satellites. We have been using communication satellites since the 1960s to connect with people all over the world. For example, the first television broadcast across the Atlantic Ocean happened between Maine and France in 1962, thanks to the Telstar satellite. Even today, our cell phones depend on communication satellites. Is that all we use satellites for? Not at all. Have you ever heard of Landsat? Landsat satellites look at Earth from the sky and send us information to help us understand our planet. NASA is also studying our Earth in other ways to learn more about challenges in the climate and how humans are contributing to these changes. Wow, so NASA really has done a whole lot more than just send a man to the moon. It sure has. NASA has played a key role in changing what we know about ourselves, our planet, and the universe around us. It's also expanded the boundaries of human capability. At first, going to the moon seemed impossible. Now, Voyager 1 is about to leave our solar system. Can you imagine that? But there is an infinite amount of exploration left to do. And here's where you can help. Whether you want to be an astronaut, an engineer, a scientist, a reporter, a teacher, or a historian, there's a place for you here at NASA. As we've seen today, NASA depends on the passion, hard work, and out-of-the-box thinking of people like you. Thanks for watching Making History. We hope you enjoyed our program. See, See you, you next time. time. Thank you.